Hi, everybody. Welcome to the mine. I am not Lynn Winters, as you can tell. And thank you, Frankie, for the nice introduction, but I never know what to do with someone who calls me intelligent. They just say they don't know me very well. At any rate, it's my pleasure to be here. I don't know why they keep asking me back, but I always love being here with you at the mine. We are well underway in a study verse by verse of the book of Romans. And what I'd like to do with you is start with some big picture stuff, then summarize where we are, then we're going to pick up at verse 17 and hopefully finish chapter 2 of the book of Romans. Now, I'm not a pastor. I'm a lawyer. I'm a layperson just like you. I want to share with you just a few of my guiding principles when I study the Bible and when I try to teach it. The first, you're going to see tonight that I show you a lot of Scripture, and that's because I believe the Word of God speaks more powerfully than anything that I could ever say up here in front of you. And the second is that I really am a strong believer in reading the Bible for yourself. Great men like John Huss and William Tyndale in the 15th and 16th century were burned at the stake so we could have a Bible in English so we could read for ourselves. The establishment churches of the time said people like us couldn't be trusted with the Bible. We needed a pastor or a priest to read it and explain it to us. But isn't it ironic that now that we have more Bibles than in, at any time in history at our fingertips, we just seem to come to church on Sunday and even to the mine on Tuesday nights to listen to a pastor or even a lawyer tell us what it means. So let's read it for ourselves. And part of that is reading it in big chunks. This is really something I want to encourage you to do, to read ahead, to read Romans in big chunks. The Bible isn't a series of sound bites, except maybe for Proverbs. It's meant to be read in big chunks so that as we study verse by verse, we can understand the big picture context of what's going on. And then it's really important to understand the context culturally of what was happening. Who's the audience that the person is writing to in the Bible? And what is going on at the time? Because if we understand that, we can understand much more fully just what the Word of God is, is trying to share with us. So the book of Romans is a legal argument. It's Paul at his logical, lawyerly best. The book of Romans is a series of arguments that progresses, it builds one on the next. And in the first argument that we have, the first thing that he's addressing is in chapters one and two. So I wanna summarize just a little bit where we are, but I know we've got mic runners. I, is there anybody who would volunteer to, to just summarize for us in one sentence the point that Paul's trying to make in Romans one and two? What's his first argument? What's he building it on? Anybody? I've seen you guys here the last several weeks. We're we are without excuse. Good. Let me hear a couple more. One sentence. We're not all that different. We're not all that different. One more. We're all, we're all guilty before God. I think you're all right. We're all saying the same thing. The message in Romans 1 and 2 is really simple, is that we've all sinned, we're all subject to God's judgment, and justly so. That's the simple message. Now, when I first uh, was asked to speak tonight so Lynn could have a, have a night off, I kind of thought, oh, Romans 2. I never heard a sermon about Romans 2. Can I skip ahead to the passages I like? I even asked Frankie, can we just skip ahead to Romans 5, 1 through 5, or 6, 23, or chapter 8, or 12, 1 and 2? I love those passages. Let's just skip ahead. And he said, no, no, we've got to do chapter 2. And I came to realize how important chapter 2 is because chapter 2 is vital to understanding this message of salvation that Paul is trying to teach us in, in the book of Romans. In these chapters, Paul shreds four popular beliefs, flawed theology that, that the Jews and the moral Gentiles of the time were teaching, and we're going to go through each one of them tonight as we progress through Romans chapter 2. And, and as Paul gets into chapter 3, verse 20, he summarizes, and maybe this is his sentence, summarizes his entire argument, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Romans chapter 2 is simply the building, building block for everything else that comes later. You know, in popular society today, we want to skip over Romans 1 and 2. 
Satan's greatest victory in my mind is getting us as Christians and as a culture to skip over chapter one and chapter two because the popular belief now is God would never send people to hell. You know, if you can do your own thing. But Jesus didn't need to die if we're not guilty to begin with. Unless I understand that I'm lost, I can never understand that I need to be found. Unless I understand that I'm guilty, I can never understand that I need to be pardoned. Unless I understand God's judgment, I can never understand God's mercy and God's grace. That's why we talk about Romans 1 and 2. That's why we've done it several weeks in a row. We've got to remember that reading the Bible is important to read it in context. When you read Romans chapter 2, if that was all you read, what would you think? You would think God's mad at you. You think God's really mad, but God doesn't hate us. He doesn't hate creation. He just hates sin. He really, really hates sin. And Romans 1 and 2 are designed to show us why we need salvation. It's really as simple as that. So let's start with what's the context, just to review a little bit. Uh, somebody shout out, who, who, who's the audience in, the, in Romans chapter 2? Lynn talked about this last week. What's that? Christian, Christians in Rome, any particular Christians in Rome? What's that? The Gentiles. You know, there, there's actually a lot of dispute about verses 1 through 16, about who it's actually targeted at. Because the interesting thing is when you read Romans chapter 1, remember Lynn talked about the fact that it takes on the, the Gentiles, the heathen Gentiles. It lists all of their sins. It's, but it also answers the question, how could somebody who never knew God, who didn't have the law, be condemned? He answers that, by, as Lynn said, by creation. Creation shows there is a God, there is some power who's bigger, stronger, and smarter. And chapter 2 says that even the Gentiles, everybody has a conscience. We have a moral compass. So we know inherently right from wrong. But all of chapter 1 talks about they. When we get into chapter 2, it starts immediately with you. So Paul puts his laser gaze on somebody. Therefore, you are inexcusable. Whoever you are, uh, whoever you are who judge, if or whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. You think this, O oh man, you judge those practicing such things. You do the same. How will you escape the judgment of God? The debate is in verse, verses 1 through 16. Is he just talking to the moralist Gentiles or is he talking to Jews as well? I, I tend to believe he's talking to Jews and Gentiles because two times in that passage he refers to both Jews and Gentiles. But when we look at the context, he may be focusing even more so on a certain group of people. There were philosophers of the time in the Roman Empire called the Stoics. And one of the leading Stoics was a guy named Seneca, who was a contemporary of Paul. Seneca was a politician. He was a moral teacher. He was even a tutor to the emperor Nero. He was very highly thought of as a virtuous man. These Gentile moralist philosophers looked down on, on the, the heathen. They, they preached virtue, but oftentimes they didn't practice what they preached. And apparently it was pretty well known that Seneca didn't practice what he preached, including uh, uh, some pretty good evidence that he was complicit in Nero's murder even of his own mother. So this is targeted at Gentile moralists and Jews in 1 through 16. And then when we get into chapter, or verse 17, it's targeted directly at the Jews. But let's deal with these four arguments, because the first two were dealt with last week. The first argument that was very prevalent with, with Jewish scholars and the Gentile moralists is, I am prosper, if I am prosperous or God hasn't punished me, I am pleasing God. In other words, if God isn't punishing me, I must be doing what I need to do. And the corollary with that is that the poor are poor because they're bad. If you're sick, it's because you've done something evil. And Paul dealt with that, and we talked about it last week, in verse 4 especially. Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? In other words, it's not that God is blessing you uh, and, and is tolerant of your behavior just because he's not punishing you. It's because he's good. He's giving us time to come to repentance. The... The second argument that was dealt with last week 
is, and this was prevalent among the Jewish rabbis, was that there were different scales of justice for Jews and Gentiles. The Jews believed that because they were the chosen people of God, that God would judge the Gentiles more harshly and he would give them a pass. And as we talked about last week, Paul says it's actually the opposite. God is impartial, which I think somebody said here. And if anything, he may be harder on the Jews because they had the law and the Gentiles didn't. He said in uh, chapter, verses 6 through 11, God will render to each one according to his deeds, indignation, wrath, tribulation, anguish, on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first, also of the Greek. There's no partiality with God. And it, it reminded me of what Jesus said, for everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. To whom much has been committed, of them we will ask the more. So that brings us up to verse 17. We want to see if we can finish this chapter tonight. Paul starts out in, in verse 17, now focused on the Jews. Whoever he's talking about in verses 1 through 16, he's now talking to the Jews specifically for the rest of this chapter. He says, indeed, if you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God, verse 18, and know his will and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law. Now, Paul tends to use longer sentences than I like, but, so we're gonna stop right in the middle of his sentence, but let's talk about what he, what he said here so far. First, he starts with the term Jew, and it seems obvious, but I did a little research, and the, the meaning of the term Jew has evolved over time. It started as just members of the tribe of Judah, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. The only people who were Jews were people who were descendants of Judah. Judah meant praise, so the term Jew was meant praise to God. It evolved over time. The first time we see the word Jew in the Bible is in 1 Kings. And then the first time we see anybody other than a, someone from Judah called a Jew is in the book of Esther. So it's in the Babylonian captivity. Uh, we, were, we refer to Mordecai the Jew. Remember Esther's uncle? Mordecai the Jew, and he's from the tribe of Benjamin. Over time, it be became anybody who followed the Jewish religion and it was taken as a real badge of honor. Now in the, in the 1940s in the Holocaust, it was used as a derogatory term, but for many, many years, it was a badge of honor. Jews who lived in Gentile villages would make their surname Jew, Mordecai the Jew. They viewed this as, as a mark that they were the chosen people of God. They were proud of that, they were proud that God had given them the law. So this is who this is addressed to, it's to the Jews, and Paul knew very well what the arguments were he was rebutting. Remember, Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was a leader of the Pharisees. When, when the crowd stoned Stephen, the Bible says that Paul was carrying everybody's coats, and we know from the culture of the time, that meant that Paul, formerly known as Saul, was a leader. He was in charge of the Pharisees. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, so he had a lot of credibility. Because we've got to be careful. We're going to talk a lot about the mistakes that the Jewish teachers were making, but this isn't an hour of bagging on the Jews. This isn't excuses that people used in the 40s and in the, and in the Holocaust and in the Crusades to bag on the Jewish people. This is something that is relevant very much to us. But Paul is speaking to a group of people who know he has credibility. Who better to talk about the arguments that he's rebutting than a leader of the Jews himself? So that's who he addresses the argument to. And then he begins his rebuttal of argument number three. Argument number three is that being circumcised as a Jew is a pass to heaven no matter what I do. That was the third argument. It was very prevalent. In fact, there was a prominent rabbi prior to Paul who taught that Abraham literally sat at the gate of hell just to make sure that no circumcised Jew didn't get through to go to hell. Now, when I start thinking of that picture, it seems a little weird. What's he doing to check? But I, anyway, that's what they thought Abraham was doing, is that no matter what, if you're circumcised as a Jew, you're going to heaven. And Paul addresses that. He starts addressing it in verse 17. You're called a Jew. You rest on the law. You make your boast in God. You know his will. You approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law. He's lay, setting up their argument. And a good lawyer will always set up the argument, and then he doesn't just call it names and throw it away. He deals with it in a very logical, progressive way, which is what 
Paul does here. He moves on to verses 19 and 20. This is the second part of the, of the sentence. You Jews who are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. What Paul's addressing here is the fact that the Jews viewed themselves as teachers of the law. They viewed themselves as the, not only recipients of it, but it was their job in part to lecture the Gentiles on the law. And this carried over into the Christian church in Rome and elsewhere. If you think about it, there were Jewish Christians, converts to Christianity, and those were people who were steeped in the law. They grew up learning it. And then there were Gentile Christians who didn't know anything about the Old Testament. So who do you think the teachers were? And this was a good thing generally, but it had seeped through into the teaching that some of these arguments were being taught, and that's part of the reason that Paul is explaining what's going on here. And we've got to remember, too, that in chapter 1, you know, remember, Paul is listing all the sins, and he's talking about the heathen, and he's talking about all the bad things they do, and these moralist Gentiles and the Jewish rabbis, what are they doing when they're reading chapter 1, talking about all the bad people? Yeah, preach it, Paul. a baby, preach it, Paul, brother. Come on, give it to them. Well, you know, now Paul's turned it to you, 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 and now he's saying you Jews, and they're probably starting to feel just a little bit uncomfortable with, with what's about to come. So we move to verse 21. You, therefore, who teach another, do not you teach yourself. I think it's pretty simple. He's simply saying, practice what you preach. You know, physician, heal thyself. There's an old saying that a lawyer who represents himself has a fool for a client. You know, if you're a teacher, listen to what you're saying. Teach yourself. You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? There's thinking that this is actually a reflection of what Jesus railed against. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. So you steal from widows, you take their houses, and then you make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. He moves on to chapter or to verse 22 in this sequence. First, it's you who teach. Do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing. Are you stealing? Then he says, you who teach, do not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? And it's pretty commonly known that there were a lot of rabbis at that time who preached one thing but were very notorious for uh, getting around, shall we say. R remember the story of the woman who was caught in the very act well, if you stop for a second, if she was caught in the act, someone saw her, okay, where was the guy? Why did they just bring the girl? But that's what they did. They just brought the woman. The man, maybe the man was one of, was one of their friends. And remember what Jesus did. He's writing in the dirt. And there's some thinking that maybe what he was writing in the dirt was Jim, sorry, Jim, uh, Alice, Martha, I know Jim's gone, Bob, uh, Kevin, Jane, uh, you know, Kevin's, and all of a sudden he looks up and everybody's gone. See, these rabbis were notorious at doing it, saying one thing and doing another. Of course, you could do that if you had a free pass to heaven if you were simply circumcised. And then he says, you who abhor idols, do you rob temples? I did some research on that. There's three different theories on what he's talking about, and maybe they're all true in a way. The first is that the Israelite armies back in the old days when they were powerful, they would, they would invade a country, they would take over the country, they would take the temple of the heathen gods, and instead of destroying the stuff in the temple, they would take it back with them to their homeland. There's another thought that, that what it's really for referring to is failing to give tithes and offerings to take care of the temple and upkeep the temple. Malachi 3.8, one of the last things that we, that we see directed at the Jews in the Old Testament, will a man rob God, yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. And then there's a thought that maybe this idea of, of you preach against robbery, but you rob temples, maybe it's just it's sacrilege against the temple. Very similar to perhaps that Jesus kicking the money changers out of the temple. You've made my house into a den of thieves rather than a, den of, a uh, place of prayer. Paul moves on. He says, you also make your boast in the law. 
do you also dishonor God through breaking the law? And then he goes on to use a quote from the Old Testament. He says, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. Now, anytime you see as it is written, I'd encourage you to try to find out where it was written. Where is it? Because the reason he says as it is written is because the people listening would know exactly what he's talking about. Uh, maybe something like if I say four score and seven years ago, I don't have to really tell you what that's from. Uh, if I say in the beginning God, well, you kind of know where that's from too. If I say J John 3.16, you know what I'm talking about. When the Bible gives a quote and it's directed at the Jews and it says as it is written, these people knew what he was talking about. We don't, or at least I didn't, so, so I looked it up. There's really three passages it seems to refer to. The first is 2 Samuel 12, 14. The context is the prophet Nathan is confronting King David about his sin with Bathsheba, followed up by his killing her husband so he can try to cover up his sin so that he can have Bathsheba for himself. And in fact, it became literally an international scandal. And what Nathan says to David is because, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who's born to you shall surely die. This was the first child from Bathsheba before Solomon. You have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. In other words, the enemies of the Lord were saying, David, who follows, he's, he's so sanctimonious, he preaches all these things to us, and look what he does. He's committing adultery and murder. We fast forward to the exile, the captivity in Egypt. We have Isaiah 52, 5. Now therefore, what have I here, says the Lord, that my people are taken away for nothing. In other words, they're exiled. Those who rule over them make them wail, says the Lord, and my name is blasphemed continuously every day. Ezekiel 36, 22, I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst, and the Lord shall know that I am the Lord. In other words, what God is saying is, when the captivity happened, the people of Israel are taken captive, the Babylonian army wins, they carry away all the property, all the people off to Babylon. And what do the people in Babylon say? Dude, you're God. <laughs> How strong can he be or he would have protected you? How strong could he possibly be? They were blaspheming the name of God. Now we know that it wasn't that God was weak. God was more than powerful enough to, to flick away the Babylonians. But because of the persistent rejection of the prophets and God's teachings, God was willing to have them sent away so they could be taught a lesson, so they could learn something, so they could become more godly. See, what God is really saying to them is, I want you to be an example. I want you to shine a light. It's what Jesus said in Matthew. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. He's saying, Jews, the, my chosen people, the reason I gave you the law, the reason I loved you is not so you could use it as an excuse to sin, not so you could just slide into heaven because you were circumcised, but because I wanted you to live in a way that would be a light to the Gentiles. I wanted you to be an example, not somebody that someone blasphemed against. Now Paul is invoking this. He's saying, look, you Jewish rabbis who are saying one thing and doing another, you Gentile moralists doing one thing and saying one thing and doing another, people are looking at you and they're saying, what kind of Christian are you? And see, that's what, that's what God wants us to do. That's a lesson for us here is to realize that God wants us to be an example to the Gentiles. Not that following a law is a way to get to heaven, but that being holy is a way to point other people to heaven. I, I went to a funeral uh, several years ago, and are the Johnsons here by any chance? If you are, raise your hand, because they're my friends. And, all right, well, this was the Johnson's friend, uh, my, the Johnson's son, and it was a, a very sad funeral, a 20-year-old great m young man who died of cancer. And the preacher said something that I've never forgotten. He said, when you die, when, live your life. Live your life in such a way that when you die, people don't have to lie about you at your funeral to make you sound good. 
Right? Have you been to that? You've been to those funerals? The funerals you go, and I'm sitting there, I'm listening to all the nice things being said about the, the, the decedent, and I'm elbowing Laura, going, Hey, I know this guy. Who, who are they talking about? <laughs> Live your life in such a way that when you die, people won't have to lie about you at your funeral to make you sound good. We need to be living our lives so that when people see us, they say, What's different about you? So that, they, that we point people to heaven as opposed to being a stumbling block. What's the thing you hear from sometimes? I would be a Christian except for the Christians. Let's not be one of those. That's part of what Paul is saying here. So let's move on. Let's move on to verse 25. And I want to spend quite a bit of time in verses 25 through 29. Paul says, For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. And we're going to talk about that, but what Paul's dealing with here is argument number four. Argument number four is that strictly obeying the law gets me to heaven. Very, very prevalent. Remember, first one is if I'm not being disciplined, God must approve of what I'm doing. Second one is, hey, God's going to give me a, God's going to judge the Gentiles more than me because I'm a Jew. Different scales of justice. Third one related, if I'm simply a circumcised Jew, I get a pass to heaven. And the fourth one is, if I can strictly obey the law, that is what's going to get me to heaven. This is a, a philosophy and a teaching that primarily came from the Pharisees. And the Pharisees You've heard a lot about them because you see them throughout the Bible. He's a, they are targets of, of Jesus' pointed rejections and arguments. But the Pharisees were a group that arose out of the Babylonian captivity. One of the reasons the Jews went and were taken to Babylon is they didn't follow God's law. For example, there was a law that said that every seven years you had to give the land a Sabbath. You had to let it lay fallow. And God would take care of you. But the Jews never did that. And one of the things Jeremiah said is, God says, I'm going to have my Sabbath. There were 490 years when they didn't give the land a Sabbath. And so guess how long the Babylonian captivity was? 70. God says, I've had my Sabbath. And so the Pharisees read and overreacted to what Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel were saying. And they came up with hypervigilant, hypertechnical, and hypocritical, nitpicky little rules for how they were going to comply with the law and work their way to heaven, entirely missing the message that God had for them. So in chapters 1 and 2, Paul is in a number of places laying out what it is that you'd have to do to actually comply with the law. Jesus does the same thing. But you look back at, at uh, the end of chapter 1, and I think this is really kind of interesting. It, verse 28, God gave them over to a debased mind. Now he's talking about the heathen Gentiles. To do those things which are not fitting, and he lists them. Sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. Okay, at this point, the, the uh, moral Jews or the moral Gentiles and the Jewish leaders are going, yeah, again, what are they saying? Preach it, brother. That's right, because we don't do that. And when I read this list, I'm thinking, yeah, maybe I could do it. If that's what it is, okay, if that's what I'm not supposed to do, maybe I could get there. Well, then he goes on. Backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, and veneners of evil things, disobedient to parents. Oh, maybe some of those I've had a little problem with, and they're, they're, maybe they're thinking that. But look at the last five. Okay, this is the list of sins that at the end he says, those who practice such things are deserving of death. If you practice any of these things, you're deserving of death. Look at the last five. Undiscerning, in other words, lacking judgment. Untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. See, I don't really see that the Pharisees came up with nitpicky ways to be more loving or nitpicky ways to be more merciful or more forgiving or nitpicky ways to show better judgment. This just shows, and Paul's laying out, even if you try everything you can, if you avoid all of the sins of commission, there's a lot of sins of omission. You are as much a sinner if you're unmerciful and unloving and unforgiving and untrustworthy and undiscerning, and it separates you from God, Paul says, just as much as if you were a murderer, an adulterer, a hater of God. Lynn talked about it last week, James 4, 17, therefore to him who knows good, knows to do good and doesn't do it, 
to him it is sin. Paul gives another list in Galatians 5. I don't want to read every single word, but you look at the list. Okay, maybe I will. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred. So far I'm thinking I'm doing okay. But then he gets into a few where I'm thinking, hmm. Okay, contentions. I'm a lawyer. What do you think I do every day? <laughs> Jealousies. Outbursts of wrath. Well, I drive in traffic. Are you kidding? Uh, selfish ambitions. Dissensions. I mean, anybody here want to say that, that they haven't been guilty of any of those? We can say, oh, I'm not a murderer. I don't do that. That's right. That's right. My sins aren't as bad. But, but this is in the list. And then he goes on to heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness. It's not even a sequence. Any of these sins separates us from God. And as I was studying this, I noticed that in Galatians, Paul quotes a particular verse. And we get to the verse in a second. It's from Deuteronomy. When I went back and looked at the verse, it, it had this, this is really sort of strange, kind of cool series of curses. And the curses really are just, don't do these things. And it said, I don't have them on the screen, but, you know, cursed are those who, is the man who lies with his father's wife. Cursed is the man who lies with an animal. Cursed is the man who lies with his mother-in-law. Did they really have to? Well, okay. <laughs> Cursed is the man who treats his father or his mother with contempt. Now listen to these. Cursed is the man who makes the blind to wander off the road. How about this one? Cursed is the man who perverts justice do the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And then... The verse that Paul quoted, Deuteronomy 27, 26. Cursed is the one who does not conform all the words of this law by observing them. So what do you think all means? I mean, I know you're thinking lawyers can twist every single word around possible. We don't twist around words named like all. And we had a president a number of years ago who, who wanted to know what is meant. We all know what all means. In other words, any single one of these things, whether it's being unmerciful or unforgiving or whether it's murder, any of these separate us from the love of God. See, Paul is building the case that you cannot strictly observe the law. This is just vital to his argument. You can't strictly observe the law and get to heaven by yourself. Jesus said the same thing. Remember in, in Matthew chapter 5, it's the Sermon on the Mount. And I think this is actually one of the primary themes of the Sermon on the Mount, is you can't do it on your own. And, and I've got the words up on the screen, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna paraphrase. What he says is, unless you are better than the scribes and the Pharisees, in other words, the people who have all these nitpicky little rules, unless you can do better than them, you're not going to heaven. You've heard it said, don't murder, and you're thinking, hey, I haven't murdered. And he says, well, wait a second. If you've been angry with your brother once without cause, you've blown it. You're not going to heaven. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. You're pretty proud of yourself. You haven't committed adultery. Jesus says, well, I'm telling you, if you've looked at a woman one time with lust in your eyes, you've blown it. You're not going to heaven. And then he goes into some verses that used to really trouble me. He says, look, if your eye causes you to sin, in other words, if you're having a lust problem with your eye, poke it out. If your right hand is causing you to sin, cut it off. He doesn't say it, but it's like if you're, if you're lying, if you're saying bad things with your tongue, cut your tongue out. And I thought, what is he talking about? But then you realize what he's saying. He's not saying, you know, I think, I think if you, Jeff, I think if you would cut your tongue out, you'd have a chance of getting to heaven. Uh, he's not saying that. What he's saying is, even if you poked your eye out, even if you cut your tongue out, even if you cut your hand off, you still can't get there on your own. It's impossible. It's way, way harder than you think. But it's way, way easier than you think because all you have to do is accept the free gift I'm offering you. Stop trying so hard at something you can't succeed at and just take the free gift. That's Romans chapter 1 and 22. Or 1 and 2. So we get to verses 26 and 27. He says, therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? In other words, an uncircumcised person, that's gonna be a Gentile, they're gonna understand that. And, and the wording seems to say, and some people have twisted it to say, well, that means that an uncircumcised person could keep the requirements of the law. 
And there's even some wording like that back in verses 7 and 10, I think it is. But, but you've got to keep in mind. First, read it in context and understand that verses or chapters 1 and 2 aren't about salvation. They don't talk about being saved. They talk about why we need to be saved. What he's saying is even if a Gentile could keep the law, and if he could, well, then I guess it'd be, it'd be like circumcision. It'd be like what you think circumcision is. See, re in reality, Paul's saying one of two things. He's either saying that if the Gentiles could be perfect, they could judge you, the Jews. Now, th this, these are fighting words for the Jews. Have you ever wondered why it is that Paul, when he went to a ta town, he usually ended up getting beaten, stoned, jailed, and kicked out? It, it's for saying stuff like this. He was speaking the truth to the people who were there, saying, look, J Jews, you're special, but you're no different from anybody else. You need Jesus everybody, like everybody else. Or, or he may actually be referencing, some people think, he may actually be referencing the fact that some Gentiles could be justified by faith before Jesus came, just like Abraham and the Jews could. You know, what does that mean to be justified by faith? What did you have to do in the Old Testament to be saved? And, and there's no place where it really spells it out, but it seems to me what you needed to do is recognize that there was a higher power, recognize that you were a sinner, humble yourself before God. Humble yourself, listen to your conscience, and, and listen right from wrong. And what he's saying is, look, circumcision, it's, it's argument number three. Circumcision isn't the be-all, end-all. It doesn't get you there. And then he says in verse 27, will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fills the, fulfills the law, judge you who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? It's the same thing. He's saying you can't do it on your own. And if the Gentiles could, they could judge you, but they can't. Now Paul gets to some really cool stuff that I want to spend some time with you on. He says in verse 28, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Now again, the people listening to this would under, this wasn't a new concept. What's he talking about circumcision of the heart? You know, when we hear that, we go, well, that's kind of a weird concept. But the Old Testament has several verses. Here's one, Jeremiah 4.4. 4, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskin of your hearts. And let's contrast that for just a moment with what Paul said earlier in, in chapter 2. Oh, it's verse 5. He talks about if you're trying to get there on your own, you're doing it with hardness and impenitent hearts, treasuring up for yourself wrath. So if you have an impenitent heart, it means you have a heart that's not willing to humble itself before God. You're not willing to admit that you're guilty. But what Paul is saying, you should be circumcised of the heart. So we've got the mic runners, and they came here, they put on their orange vest, and I haven't used them at all. So, so let the, if, if, what I'd like to do is talk a couple minutes. Let's hear from you what you think it means to be circumcised of the heart. So, so raise your hand, and, and our uh, fast microphone runners will get to you. What, what does it mean to be circumcised of the heart? Bueller? <laughs> Bueller? Come on, somebody's got to give me a shot here. Any takers? Okay, we, oh, yes, we got a taker. Circumcision, the act of circumcision is cutting away. So I look at it as opening your heart to God. That's good. Kind of like what Lynn was talking about maybe a week or two ago about cutting away the scar tissue on your heart. Circumcision of the heart. I, I like that. I hadn't thought about that. It's beautiful. That's tough to top. But anybody else want to take a shot at it? Do we have one back here? Yes, sir. It's just uh, taking away those, yeah, the uh, impurities in your life. And, you know, it, throughout Scripture, it uses the heart as just like, you know, your, your inward being. So it's just like, you know, the, just all, all within yourself, you know, what is it that, that's keeping, you know, those impurities, you know, cut that off. Yeah, I, th I, think that's, I think that's really good because one of the lessons that Paul is teaching us in chapter 
1 and chapter 2 is that God doesn't necessarily look at the acts. He looks at the motives. He looks at the heart. And I've got a slide up here. Remember what Samuel said, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Let's look at a few scriptures and, and see if we can kind of come to understand a little bit more about, about what it means to be circumcised to the heart. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. So let's stop right there. How do we have our hearts circumcised? We can't do it ourselves. God is going to do it for us. That's the first thing to remember, is it's God who will circumcise our hearts. And so what does it mean? Well, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, that you may live. The first step toward circumcision of the heart is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to humble yourself before God. And another passage, Deuteronomy 10, 16 Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. And I thought this was really cool. When I read on, it seems to me an explanation of one way that you can have your heart circumcised. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality, sounds familiar, nor takes a bribe. He administers justice to the fatherless and the widow, loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore, love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Love your neighbor as yourself. Take care of the poor. Serve and honor justice. What did Jesus say when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's what being circumcised of the heart means. That's what the Old Testament prophets were talking about repeatedly. It's not about nitpicky rules. You can't do it by yourself. You do it by allowing God to give you the gift of grace so that you love the Lord with all your heart and so you, you treat the poor kindly so that we don't pervert justice. We take care of the widows. We take care of the fatherless, the orphans. We take care of the poor. And then there's Deuteronomy. Oop, let me skip ahead. We did that one. It's like uh, James says in verse, uh, chapter 127, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, to keep oneself unspotted from the Lord. So, so how do we do this? I mean, and, and I just have a, a couple thoughts. One is, is we'll get to it in, in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Transform your minds. Allow God to just take over your minds. And Paul tells us we're bringing every thought captive. Because earlier in verse 16, uh, Paul says, God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to his gospel. Um, more a comment. Um, <clears throat> the Jews of the day. I can't, I can't. Will you wave your hand so I can at least look at you? Oh, there you are. Okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, the Jews of the day, the men, wore circumcision as a badge of honor. Yes. And when you jokingly referred to Abraham, what was he looking at when they came to go to heaven? Remember earlier? Yes. Okay. Well, the circumcision of the heart is not visible mm. other than by how you live, how you treat the widows and orphans and, and living by the golden rule. And additionally, it opens the door for women to be circumcised. Mm. I, I like that a lot because you're absolutely right. A woman couldn't be physically circumcised, but a woman can be just as much circumcised of the heart as a man. That, that's beautiful. Uh, fits right in with the idea that there's no partiality with God. And, and this idea that you can't see the circumcision of the heart, uh, I want to skip back to, well, maybe I won't skip back. I'll just remind us. Remember at the end of of this chapter, at the end of verse 29. Paul says, be circumcised of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is from men, but not from God, which is exactly what you're saying. And, and I just want to tell you, that, that's just a credo for me. 
It, it's easier said than done. But think about that. Part of being circumcised of the heart is that your praise comes from God and not from men. Yeah, I wanted to share this verse with you. It's Habakkuk 2.4. Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. In other words, when Paul talks about the just living by faith, it's not a new concept. It comes straight from the Old Testament. But, but then here we are in terms of, of uh, doing your charitable deeds in secret. Jesus said, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets. They may have their glory from men, Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees you in secret will reward you openly. Wow. I, I want to encourage you to serve the poor, to, to give of your finances, to not withhold your tithes and offerings, to give to purple chairs, to give to missions, to take care of the widows and the orphans. And you know, I want to encourage you, maybe whatever this means to you, to do it secretly. Because there is no praise, and no offense, there's no praise any of you could possibly give me, even if you wanted to, that would even come close to the praise that you hope to have from God, from what God could give us. Whose praise is not from men, but whose praise is from God. And, and let's be honest, that's a, that's a hard thing, isn't it? I mean, I'll be transparent. That's a hard thing for me. If I get up and speak in a church or if I get up and I, and I sing and things don't go well, which, which happens, uh, when I'm done, I get Satan in the back of my head going, that was bad. You did really bad. You embarrassed yourself today. You should never do that again. But then if things go well, what's Satan saying? He's not saying praise God, is he? He's saying, that was really good. He, that, that was good. You did really well. You did well. You should be proud of yourself. And he just go, get away from me. Because we don't do this. We don't do this to, to praise ourselves. We do this to, to, to point people to Jesus. Any service that we do, the whole idea of being circumcised of the heart is to point people to Jesus, that our praise would not come not from men, but from God, that we would point people to God, but that people wouldn't point at us, and we take pride in saying, oh, there's a good Christian, because there's not, because I'm not. You know, Paul, is it Paul that says, I'm, I'm chief among all sinners, and, and, and I'm in his club? Maybe some of you are too, because part of, part of being circumcised of the heart is to humble ourselves before the Lord. So we got just a few more minutes, and I... I wanted to just throw out a, a couple things, a couple ideas. It's really important to me that we not just take verse after verse and go out of here understanding the context in the Bible a little more, but that we be able to leave here saying, how is my life different? How from Romans chapter two could my life be different tomorrow and next week and next year? And, and I made just a couple notes, and one of them is just, trying to make sure that we're humble before God. Because if we can't get there on our own, if, if, if doing any little sin subjects us to judgment, then we should be really humble before God. And then there's the thing about, you know, judging people with bigger sins. You know, and, and every Sunday, well, most every Sunday, usually in the 12 o'clock service, my family and I, we sit right down there, right where you are. And uh, so you're in our seats, take good care of it. Um, and, but, but, you know, saying pa Pastor Lynn's real good about, uh, about preaching against uh, sins like adultery and, and addictions and pornography and, and uh, all kinds of things like that. And, and I got to be honest, once in a while I sit there going, preach it, brother, because I don't have a problem with those things. But wait a second. I'm sitting there being unforgiving, unloving, unmerciful, judgmental, I'm doing the same thing. I'm separating myself from God just like anybody else. You know, it's kind of like, remember the church lady on Saturday Night Live? I mean, that used to really bother me. And maybe because it came close to home, because she was just a little superior. And we gotta be really careful, at least I do, not to feel like I'm just a little superior because I come to Cornerstone and because I don't do all those things. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't go with girls, who, or don't drink, I don't chew, I don't go with girls who do. We gotta be really careful about that. Remember, yeah, yeah, some of you are old enough like me to remember that one. Um, now here's another one. 
we got to really beware setting rules that define ourselves as Christians. Jeff back there, he and I went to a great church growing up uh, in, in Ohio. And there were wonderful people there who poured themselves into our lives. But this church, this was a church of the 70s. It was a very strict Baptist church. I got to tell you, we didn't even like Billy Graham and the Southern Baptists were going to hell, all right? But, but there seemed to me that there were a lot of rules. There were a lot of great things in the church, but there were a lot of rules. Definitely no drinking, no smoking, no drugs, no dancing. Oh, that rock and roll, even if it's Christian rock and roll, horrible. Keep your hair real short. Make sure your skirt is long if you're, if you're a lady. Uh, there were all these so many rules. We had the softball team. And, and when we played softball, you know, it was Ohio. It was a rare day when it was sunny. And, and when we're warming up, we might take our, our uniform shirt off and try to get a little suntan on our, on our white bodies. Hey, the pastor's coming to play today. Great. No, you've got to put your shirt on. What I wonder is, is, and it seemed to me, that it was easier to set up a bunch of rules that defined us as Christians than to do what God's really saying about serving the poor. We've got to be really careful not to set up a bunch of rules. I'm a Christian because I do this, do this, or don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. I'm a Christian because I go to church. I'm a Christian because I was baptized as a child. I'm a Christian because I was baptized at Cornerstone, because I went to the membership class, because I give the missions, because I come to the mine. No, we're not a Christian because we do those things. Any religious symbol, any set of rules is just a symbol. Don't confuse the symbol with the act. Don't set up a a set of rules that we define ourselves in terms of being Christians. So, Lynn has talked a couple times about the fact that the book of Romans used to be taught in uh, some American law schools. And you should check out things that Lynn says or that I say, and I checked it out, and it's true. In fact, uh, law schools at, at some point uh, required students, law students, to learn the book of Romans. And the reason is, is it was such a wonderful sequence of argument. It taught people how to do arguments. And I thought, well, why don't I do what I did in law school or what I do at work sometimes if I have a case or a brief? I'm going to sit down. I'm going to read Romans in, in, a, in a full chunk. And I'm going to really get the message that's going on here in the book of Romans. And I did that. I wrote it down. Uh, and you know, I summarized it just like I might at work. And, and I don't have time to go through it with you. If anybody cares, I have my brief on the book of Romans right here. So if you want to read ahead and see at least what, what I was thinking, uh, you're welcome to come down and, and get that. But it struck me that I wanted to end with a little big picture. This is sort of a where we're going in Romans. What is the sequence of argument that Paul is laying out? And to do that, I want to use a little illustration. And I think most of you have heard part of this, but I hope that there's something here maybe that that you haven't heard. So I want you to just imagine a courtroom. Maybe it's the Maricopa County Superior Court, and it's a criminal court. And there's somebody who has been convicted of all kinds of heinous crimes. He's been found guilty, and now it's time to sentence. And he comes into the courtroom, and naturally he's got, his, he's got himself chained up, or they've chained him up. And uh, he comes into the courtroom, and he stands at the defendant table. The judge calls things to order. This, by the way, is a gavel from the gift shop of the United States Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. <laughs> the judge calls things to order, and I've had this thing for 25 years and never did that. And he, and he says to the prosecutor, hey, prosecutor, what, what is this man charged with? And he lists out all the crimes. And, uh, and he says to the criminal, he says, uh, you know, you've been found guilty. Do you have anything to say for yourself? Well, I'd ask him for forgiveness. I've, uh, you know, I've really turned my life around. Please, please don't punish me. And it, I mean, what happens after that? The judge goes, okay, yeah, I hear you. Uh, I'm going to sentence you to the maximum. And the maximum the penalty is death. So the criminal, he, he, he turns around, he starts heading back to jail because he's executed to death. And as he's walking away, what he hears is the prosecutor speak up and say, excuse me, judge, I'll take his penalty. You see, the sentencing, the guilty part is Romans 1 and 2. Then the prosecutor stands and says, I'll take his penalty. No one would ever do that. You can't imagine anybody doing that. But of course, that's what Jesus does for us. That's Romans 3 through 7. That's taking away the penalty of the sin. And we can see, obviously, that's Jesus, the prosecutor, taking our sin. But it would be really, it could be awesome if that just ended right there. 
Because if Jesus would just take away the penalty of our sin, isn't, isn't that enough? But that's not the end of the gospel. Romans doesn't end at chapter seven. The cool thing is, is Jesus says, the prosecutor says, I'll take his penalty. So, you know, the criminal's going, whew, whew that's pretty cool. And so he walks away. And what's gonna happen in court if this implausible thing happens? That criminal's gonna go back to his family and his friends. He's gonna go back to his same neighborhood. He's gonna probably commit the same crimes and he's gonna be back in court. He's gonna go back where he came from. But now this is the wild part about the story. This is the wild part about Christianity. That as, as the criminal's walking out of the courtroom, the judge says, wait, there's more. Come back here. Look, I'm God the Father. This is my son, Jesus, the prosecutor. What we'd like to not do is just free you of the penalty of your sin and send you back to your old ways. We're inviting you to come live at our house. Not only come live at our house, we're inviting you to be part of our family. I want you to be one of my children. Can you imagine that? I want you to be part of my children. You're gonna come back to the house. You're gonna be part of the family. Now, the, and that's chapter eight. That's the reconciliation to God's family, being part of his family. Now, the criminal could say, no, I'm gonna do it on my own. I'm gonna go back to prison and try to, try to get out of this myself. That's Romans nine through 11, because the Jews reject Jesus. But more likely, criminals are gonna say, yeah, I wanna be part of your family. Let me be part of this family. And that's Romans 12 through 16. It's the transformation. It's becoming more like Jesus. It's sanctification. That's the story of Romans. That's the story of Christianity. That's how it's so cool. And it all starts with Romans 1 and 2. It all is founded on this idea that we're all guilty, and justly so. So any questions, uh, any comments? This was your chance to stump me, frankly, Frankie said, which wouldn't be very hard. <laughs> Frankie's going to post it to the website on the mine. You can get it there. <laughs> any, any other questions? Well, Frankie, I know you wanted to talk. You want to come on up? And, and while he's doing that, so why don't I uh, lead us in prayer? Dear Lord, you know, thank you for your word. Thank you for what happens when two or three or 200 are gathered in your name that you are here, that you're here in our presence. Thank you that Romans doesn't end, the story doesn't end after chapter two. Thank you that the story doesn't end after chapter seven. Thank you that you invite us to be not only free from the penalty of sin, but free from the power of sin. And that eventually after we die and we come to heaven to be with you, that we can be free from the presence of sin. I pray that this would change our lives as we move forward, that, that these truths that you're teaching us, that we can't do it ourselves, that you want us to humble ourselves, that you want us to circumcise our hearts, you want us to love you with everything that we have, that you want us to take care of our neighbors, even when our neighbors are people we don't like, that you want us to serve the poor, the widows, that you want us to do those things, and that most of all, you want us to do things for you and not for other people. May we go from here wanting our praise to be from, from you, not from others, knowing that we have the comfort of salvation, but the desire to be more and more like you, to know you, to be transformed by you, to be more and more like you, and to be part of your family. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks.